This is part five in a series of videos in which I'm trying to improve the performance of this T962A reflow oven. In the previous videos I've got as far as uh, trying various different methods for improving the profile. So when I started the um, project this is the results I was getting from the uh, instrumentation card I'd made which is nothing more than a bare PCB with eight thermocouples attached to it. Now, before I go any further in this video, I thought I'd just uh, address a few interesting comments that I've had so far. What I'm using to do this uh, testing is some fairly advanced equipment. It's quite expensive, but you don't need to use expensive equipment. Um, you could do the same thing using uh, a number of um, discrete uh, thermocouple meters or really any temperature meters that will go up to two or three hundred centigrade. There are disadvantages in using discrete meters like this and I will be doing a completely separate video on this um, fairly shortly. And there are certain things that if you're not aware um, of the limitations of this sort of meter then it could cause some confusion. And this will become more apparent as we go further through the project and even in this video I'll be just touching on that to a greater extent. In general with meters like that over this temperature range you're probably looking at an accuracy of no better than plus or minus one centigrade and that's if you don't get any other errors coming into the uh, system. We're looking at kind of a system here that we've created that includes our instrumentation and it is important to view this as an entire system including your calibration equipment because that will give you the overall degree of uncertainty for what we're looking at on the final results. If you don't do that you can end up with a situation where you're spending more time trying to figure out why what you're trying isn't working than in actually, actually making any progress. And I'll explain what I mean as we go through this video. So what I've got so far is we started with this and as you can see it's a very poor profile. The temperature span um, at the peak was around 40 degrees. Um, the lower temperatures were only just achieving 200 degrees while maximum was up around 240 and with that spread it was going to be impossible to get a good consistent reflow. So I made some small changes using some thermal baffles and what I ended up with was uh, quite a good improvement. So we went from 40 degrees down to sort of 12, 15 degrees um, and it also made it far more consistent so if I did multiple runs then I would get very consistent results even though they were hot and cold start runs they were very consistent. But even so the critical phase in these runs is from when we activate the flux down here up through this part of the curve because this is where the board is being heated and where the reflow starts to take, uh, take place. So the real challenge is to try and reduce this um, spread of temperatures. There are several other things you need to take into account if you're doing this and this again comes down to if you're using discrete meters and that is the uh, sample rate and sample intervals. Because this is a fairly rapid rise in temperature this entire run is only seven minutes long so these phases are very short you know we're only talking about sort of 30 seconds uh, over this particular period and that means that the sample rate and interval is important. Now with this particular equipment it takes of course eight samples one for each probe and it does that once a second but that means that those samples are spread out over a one second period so if you zoomed into this you, although you would see step ups for each probe at the same time when the software updates the point in that one second period when the sample was taken are not all the same so although you see these steps that's not truly indicative of necessarily when the particular reading was taken and you need to take that into account what we're aiming for here is effectively a single line uh, when we can guarantee you that the entire spread is within one or two degrees and in order to do that we need to have very good relationships between the different probes that we're using in other words we need to look at very homogeneous readings across the entire set of probes we're using 
both in the time domain and, of course, in, in the uh, uh, calibration and temperature. So that's something that you need to take into account. And although, as I said, you can do this sort of work with um, discrete meters, it is important to understand if you're doing that that you need to take control of the way the readings are being taken as well as the uh, raw calibration of the, uh, the meters themselves. Uh, also when doing this you need to have a fairly formal approach to the way you're doing the testing. If you just start throwing lots of ideas you might get a single run when it looks quite promising and think you're making progress but it might be a one-off something might have caused it to do that. So I'm doing probably 10, 15, 20 runs with each particular um, idea that I'm trying each step and each change and making sure I'm getting consistent results because if I'm not then I'm not necessarily heading in the right direction. When you put all those things together you can make small incremental steps and that's generally what you'll see in projects like this. Sometimes you'll get a big step forward um, but then you run into the, the law of diminishing returns where each subsequent step will have a smaller and smaller impact. Um, where we are here with um, you know, a 10 or 12 or 15 degree spread at the peak, the best improvement where we're going to make is 15 degrees. But because we'll have to superimpose on that any errors uh, in, our, in our instrumentation, then uh, it becomes very difficult if you don't have extremely good instrumentation to figure out if you're heading in the right direction or not, because your average um, errors might only be changing by half a degree or one degree each time you change each time you try something. So that's why we need equipment that's many times more precise than you might imagine you would need to test something like a reflow oven. Although the reflow oven itself is only accurate to one or two degrees at best, uh, we need something that's going to give us results that are probably better than a tenth of a degree, just because we're looking at multiple runs, averaging temperatures, and we need to make sure that we are taking absolute readings. Just because the oven itself doesn't read accurately doesn't mean that our development instrumentation should be inaccurate as well, otherwise we've got no idea whether we're improving things or, or they're staying the same or even getting worse. So when we start putting all that together it means we can continue making small incremental improvements to the system. So I then went from the baffled only idea to fitting a fan. Uh, that made a, a huge step improvement. And this is one of a series of about 15 uh, runs that I did. It was uh, average across the runs and I was getting a delta, which is the, the, the temperature up here, the difference up here, from highest to lowest, uh, of 6.7 degrees. Uh, if you remember at the beginning of this project, I said I was aiming for maybe five degrees or better and so we're getting fairly close to that but still here this this ramp up period is getting quite good uh, but still not really as good as I would like uh, but what we have done is we've gone from a situation where every time the heat has turned on the temperatures were diverging to a situation now when the heat has turned on the temperatures are converging so in other words we're definitely heading in the right direction you can see at this point when the cooling fan turns on then uh, all better off, it's just blowing huge amounts of air around. But this phase is, n is not particularly critical, you just don't want it to be too rapid because that can cause uh, issues with the quality of soldering. You also of course want to make sure that we don't overshoot because uh, that can, even if it doesn't damage components straight away, it can uh, shorten their life. On this particular profile I have got quite a long dwell at the top just to see how things um, settle down, to see how good the basic uh, performance of the chamber is, so I'm not going straight from peak to cooling. I'm just making sure that uh, once the heat is turned off that um, the, the chamber is still fairly stable. So what I've been doing from this point is trying to optimize the fan. It's obviously a very promising um, step so I was uh, looking at uh, trying to find out what the best size, shape, speed etc for the fan was. And that's now taken me on to um, an optimised setup or semi-optimised where we've now got to uh, this and as you can see it's a definite improvement and then once I started fully optimising the fan so in this particular um, profile I've just got the fan uh, speed if you like this is the power going to the fan it's just um, um, 
relative uh, value here. I'll, I'll formalize this more once I know which particular one is the uh, best solution. And this is just so I can do comparative uh, tests across different runs. So as you can see, we're now getting very good performance on the ramp up, um, but I still optimize the fan a little bit further. So on this particular run, you can see we're now getting uh, almost um, a single line in this part of the heating phase. And this is, as I say, the critical part from when we activate the flux through heating the board to the peak. We're getting a delta temperature, uh, a spread of temperatures of less than five degrees. So this has already met the target I initially set. So we're getting 4.7 degrees. And uh, again, this is optimizing the fan for a certain speed. It's not uh, critical. I'm optimizing the fan speed, but also I'm trying to create a fan shape and size where the speed is not particularly critical because it will of course vary and it's going to be, I don't really want to have to have a very precisely controlled fan. So this uh, in now is not at all uh, critical. Uh, it does work over quite a wide range of speeds. It's more the fan size and shape uh, blade width that's important. But you can see it's going to be hard to improve beyond this. We're getting um, within one degree spread as it's heating across the entire board. And this is what I was saying about the instrumentation needed to be precise. If the errors in the probes were one degree or more, then there's no way we could ever do this. And if we're going to try and optimize something, we might as well try and optimize it properly. Uh, and that way any errors that are then subsequently introduced into the oven will make this worse. But because we've got a good starting point, this should still be uh, much better than we started with. Uh, again, um, nice consistent um, response. It does this every time and it doesn't seem to matter now whether it's a hot or cold start. It's also going up very close within a couple of degrees of the set temperature. And as I said previously, if you watch the displays on these ovens, the default behavior is you'll see the readings that it's taking are nowhere near the profile. They're kind of vaguely following it, but they're all over the place. Uh, whereas now they're effectively plotting the line of the profile up until the point, probably halfway down the cooling. Uh, but of course the systems I'm putting in place here have no real control of the cooling because the cooling fan itself is blowing so much air through. So the baffle I fitted inside the chamber to redirect and cut down the airflow from the cooling fan has tidied this up a great deal. We used to get a huge spread on here. It has slowed it down. Uh, this will be slightly faster once I put the ducting back onto the fan at the moment, not all the air from the fan is going through the chamber. And because there's some back, uh, back pressure being produced by the baffle, um, it is slowing this down a little bit. But uh, even so, this is still uh, well within a reasonable um, cool down rate. And it also gives the um, controller a lot more authority over this cooling phase, especially the start of it. Um, whereas previously the fan would come on for a few seconds turn off and the heat has come back on. It doesn't do that anymore. The um, cooling fan comes on, stays on for a while, turns off, comes back on, etc. And the uh, heat has never come back on. So we get a nice clean cool down. So we're definitely going in the right direction here. The uh, fan itself uh, was getting too hot. Um, not surprisingly, because it was too close to the chamber. What I've done now is I've uh, made an extension to the uh, fan shaft and the fan itself is now a lot higher up. I could go slightly higher if I wanted to but I can't go too high of course because the uh, top cover is over here. Um, but now it's staying down about 60 degrees centigrade which is um, easily cool enough for the fan to survive. Should be fine in here but uh, obviously only time will tell as to how reliable these are. You can get high temperature fans but I don't think it's going to be needed. Um, as I said, this could be thermally isolated even further, use a thinner drive shaft, thinner standoffs, but um, I don't think it's necessary. I'll keep uh, track on that and uh, I'll keep monitoring the temperature of the motor to make sure it doesn't get too hot, especially once I start um, putting the uh, insulation and covers back on. So that's it with the fan and the next step, the next thing I'm going to try is some additional baffle plates inside the chamber. These are the um, perforated plates I was talking about in conjunction with the fan. And then once I've tested that, final thing I'm going to try is to simulate a conveyor belt or conveyor system within the chamber. Um, obviously I can't fit a conveyor 
um, but I can simulate it. I'll explain how I'm going to go about doing that uh, once I've uh, tried it. It's fairly simple to do. Uh, the main complication in designing it was obviously the drawer still needs to open so I couldn't have a fixed drive. Uh, but I have got something uh, worked out and I'll show that in a, a later video. Um, but we're definitely making uh, huge improvements. I would say that already it's at the point where this machine is now usable. Even if we were to limit ourselves to just the changes I've made so far, uh, hopefully you can see that it's taken it from something that was very difficult to use, uh, if not impossible to use uh, reliably, to a reflow oven that will give consistent reliable results and should give a good reflow across this entire board. Bear in mind this board f uh, is the full width of the uh, the drawer so is worst case but even so this um, profile tends to in indicate that we would get very good uh, reflow on the board. Naturally the final step in all this will be to run some boards through to make sure that um, what we're seeing here is actually um, shown in the results that we get from doing actual board processing. Um, but there's uh, no reason it shouldn't be. Uh, as ever, any questions, comments are welcome and um, hopefully this will end up being of some use to some people.